Let's keep talking about ANOVA, which we will be doing for several lectures here. Let's talk about how hypothesis testing applies. It's actually very straightforward. It applies the same way it applies to everything else, but some of the details are important to know. So let's just walk through some of this stuff. In general, you have the same kind of idea for hypothesis testing in ANOVA, except that the diagram, it's not usually terribly useful to label a diagram of F, of the F distribution. It's just, it's abstract enough and complex enough that people don't really have kind of a mental connection with it like they do with a T or normal distribution. Um, I mean, the expected value isn't a mean anymore. It's this odd ratio thingy. Anyway, it's very useful, but sometimes it's hard to kind of connect with it mentally here. So we don't often draw a diagram, but we still have a critical value. We look up an F critical value. You just need to know your degrees of freedom and your alpha level. We have an F observed, and that's where the hard work comes in of calculating. Uh, and then we compare those two to each other. And luckily, there's no more two-tailed, one-tailed tests. Everything is one-tailed, and everything is right to the right. So if F observed is greater than F critical, then you reject the null hypothesis. And then you state your conclusion, which is about whether all the means in the population are different from each other or not. So here's an example using some data that you've seen partially so far. Let's say that somebody's studying the number of children that people have by political party, and they do a pathetically small study. The research question is, do people with different political preferences have different numbers of children, essentially? And let's say they test it with alpha equals 0.01. This alpha looks like an A in this font. I should choose a different font where alpha actually looks like alpha, damn it. So they, let's say they randomly sample a very pathetically small number of, sam of families. Um, from three different political backgrounds, uh, Democrats, Republicans, and Tea Party people. So let's say that's what's going on. The null hypothesis is that the mean number of children for all three of those groups is the same. And in our sample, we should see uh, something pretty similar going on if, it, if it's the same in the population. The alternative hypothesis is that at least two of those population means differ from each other. As you recall, we could state that differently. We could say not all the means are different, or we could say there is variability among the means in the population, etc. I'm choosing this, at least two means are different for our sample here, or for our hypothesis. So here's some data. There's only three uh, cases in each group. In, each, in this case, a case is a family not an individual. So the Democrats, one family had one child, zero children, two children. The Republicans, there was a family of five children, two children, four children, and the Tea Party, five, one, and three. So here's me spewing my, my uh, terrible stereotypes all over the place about Democrats and Republicans and Tea Party people, but I needed some kind of an example. You can look at the group means. The Democrat group mean is one, the Republican group mean is 3.67, and the Tea Party group mean is three. So that's nice. The grand mean, if you just take all nine of these numbers and add them and divide them by nine, is 2.56. So that's kind of handy. You could have done that pretty easily in about two minutes on your calculator. There's not very many numbers. There's only nine numbers here. Three groups. It shouldn't be too very difficult to figure out how to do this. Uh, I'm not going to show you calculations here, but I'm going to show you the results of the calculations, and we're going to talk conceptually about what's going on. Now, there are three groups, and so the number of degrees of freedom between groups is two, because it's k minus one. k is three here, because k just means the number of groups. So degrees of freedom is number of groups minus one, so that's two. Within groups is, let's go back to this, it's this n minus one plus this n minus one plus this n minus one. That's a way to think of it. So this n minus 1 is 2, this is 2, and this is 2. So you get 6. Or you can say n plus n plus n minus k. So 3 plus 3 plus 3, which is 9, minus k, which is 3. So 9 minus 3 gives you 6. Either way, that works out. So sometimes it's most useful to fill in degrees of freedom first, because then you can look up your f critical value. You actually need a really huge f value to reject the null hypothesis here, because it's a tiny study. Very tiny studies require extremely compelling evidence. Um, you shouldn't probably be doing something with cells of three, but for example purposes it works. So the F critical for alpha of 0.01 for two and six degrees of freedom, two degrees of freedom in the numerator of the F ratio, six in the denominator, so two for between subjects, six for within subjects, is 10.925. So we need an F observed to be greater than 10.925 to reject the null hypothesis here. So let's go back to our data table. We need to find the sum of squares between groups. So I worked up this little diagram. Maybe it will help you. 
so here's the number of children on this x-axis here, on this number line, 0 to 5. The Democrats are down here. There was one with 0, one family with 0 children, one with 1 child, and one with 2 children. The mean of that is 1. 0, 1, and 2, the mean is 1. No, no problem. So uh, that mean is right there. We're going to get the between subjects variability, so we're just looking only at the means of the groups. So here are the Republican uh, families. You had a 2 child and a 4 child and a 5 child family. There's the mean. And then you have the Tea Party families. You had a 1, a 3, and a 5. And there's the mean, 3. So we find the grand mean, which is that 2.56, I believe. And then we look at the deviations of each of those means from the grand mean. So we do exactly what we would do with a regular variance. If we only had three numbers, um, we would just say, we'd figure out the variability of the variance by just taking x minus x bar squared, etc. So, but we only figure out the numerator of that. We don't figure out the whole variance. We just figure out the top part of the equation. We just take x minus x bar squared, and we add that up. So it turns out the sum of squares between is 11.56, which is what you get if you take the difference between this and this and square it and add that to the difference between this and this and square it and the difference between this and this and square it. You add those, those together. Sum of squares between is 11.56. So we'll just plug that into our, our source table here, our ANOVA table. So now let's do sum of squares within. Back to our table, let's just kind of remember what that looks like there, our data table. Well, here are the Democrats, there's their mean. We need to look at the variance. So the deviation between this person's number of families and one, that's one, and that's a deviation of one. This is a deviation of zero. So the sum of squares is two, because one squared plus one squared plus zero squared is two. It's the numerator of a variance formula. It's the sum of x minus x bar squared. So that's the Democrat sum of squares. The Republican sum of squares is right here. You've got the mean, and then you've got the deviation between this family with two and the mean, this family with four and the mean, and this family with five and the mean. You square those, you add them together, and you get 4.67. So the Republican sum of squares is 4.67. And then the Tea Party component of the sum of squares, you've got a two, and you've got a two, and then this Tea Party uh, family was the mean, so their deviation is zero. So you're going to have eight. 2 squared is 4, 2 squared is 4, 0 squared is 0. The total T party sum of squares is 8. You add all those things together, and your total sum of squares is 14.67 if I did this correctly. And I think it is. Yeah. So we just put that in our table. There you go. 14.67. And now we need to find the mean square between. Now I plugged in this total. It should be this plus this equals this, more or less. Um, it might not, I might not have done that right. Anyway, we'll, we'll see someday. So uh, we need the mean square between sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom. There you go, 11.56 divided by 2, 5.78. So you don't have to go back to the data anymore. Once you've got the sum of squares for these two things, you're done with the data. You just work from the table at this point and do very simple arithmetic with a calculator or even scribbling things with your pencil. So there you go. And then the mean square within, you do the same thing. 14.67 divided by 6, 2.44. It's going to be a close one. It's almost 6. That's almost 3. It's going to be 2-ish. Yeah, that might not be enough. Remember, F critical was like 10? Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. So we divide 5.78 by 2.44 to find our F ratio, our observed F value. 2.36. Is it statistically significant? No, it totally is not. F critical is 10.925. 2.36 isn't even close. Remember, there's no question. There can never be a negative F value, whether critical or observed. Uh, it's always one-tailed. Everything's always going to the right. So bigger is always better with F. And this is really not big enough. So 2.36 isn't anywhere near close. So we could say the evidence does not support the hypothesis that the number of children per couple differs by political party. F with 2 and 6 degrees of freedom equals 2.36. P is greater than 0.01. So next time, we'll actually do some calculations.